Hi everyone, um, I'd like to um, introduce and welcome um, Tim Wells, who is um, a long-term poet, long-time poet even, and author. Well, um, he's got a jail term of his own. <laughs> and he's going to do a couple of readings for us today. Um, uh, Tim is a supporter of libraries, libraries even, are you not? Definitely, you've got to love the library, yeah, even um, North Arrow. Including North Harrow Community Library, yeah, especially North Harrow Community Library. And we no, hope sorry. we hope when we reopen and things get back to normal that you can come in and do um, some live readings for us. Well, it's always good to get sure somewhere new. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what are you going to treat us with today? Well, well, I've got um, this book here, which is a werewolf pulp horror. And I've got this one which is some poems so i'll do a little bit from each so um take your pick what do you want me to start with uh i think with the book with the book okay well the book is set in uh 1979 you've actually seen me read from it before and you know the first thing to do when reading 70s fiction is the splash on the brute <laughs> so there we go Getting in the mood now. So uh, the gentlemen and ladies of a certain age will recall that well. So uh, now the mood is set. So, um, right, this is actually chapter 11. In this book, there's uh, mostly set around North East London. There's a, uh, in 1979, there's a skinhead werewolf running around whose sideburns get really big when the moon is full. This is chapter 11. The reggae record was talking about wolves and leopards trying to kill the sheep and the shepherd, which you might remember was from this Dennis Brown album here, Wolves and Leopards. Joe sang along with a Dennis Brown single, Grace and His Record Deck. He'd woken after sleeping late and feeling rough, but after a strong coffee was feeling more chipper. After watching the Ipcrest Valley, he paid more attention to proper coffee. He got a copy of Len Dayton, of, yeah. he got a copy of Len Dayton's action cookbook, which actually is this book here. And it's Len Dayton, a thriller writer, who also had a cookery column. And he used to do these little cartoon strips about food, and this is actually the coffee one. And in the Ipcress file, there's quite a lot, fun enough, about food, where um, a lot of it is about class between him and his boss. And there's a great bit where they're buying mushrooms, and there's also a bit about coffee in the Ipcress file. So uh, I'm digressing, but that's fun. <laughs> like Harry Palmer, he thought the working class people should live well. He bought a Bialetti coffee maker from a local Italian deli. A bit fanciful, but he made coffee with a kick. Len Dayton advised treating coffee like a luxury, making it carefully serving it hot and not wasting it by making weak brews. Joe agreed wholeheartedly. He'd taken to the whole ritual of making espresso in the morning. With a couple of cups in him and a stack of reggae records playing, he was feeling set for the day already. He looked over at the picture of Madeline Smith sat in a frame on his bookshelf by his bed and gave her a wink. She was in a resplendent pose. The source for comedy and horror films, a distinct British glamour. The British take on glamour is more than a hint of kitchen sink to it. That it's a glamour we might just reach or see through is what makes it real compared with the untouchable Hollywood fantasy. Jo was particularly fond of a scene in The Vampire Lovers where she was seduced by the imposing Ingrid Pitt. Say no more. I think that's about as racy as this chat gets, to be honest. Other ones, more so. Yesterday's clothes were strewn about the bedsit floor. They looked to be a right mess too. Again, more than a normal weekend's doings. Joe wasn't adverse to a tear-up, but he wasn't one of those two-pint bullies. There was blood on his shirt and trousers. He didn't remember a Barney. The warm cheerfulness of Madeline Smith faded as a vague doubt suggested itself. Still, if something that bad had happened, he'd know about it, right? He scooped the clothes up and dumped them in a duffel bag for the laundrette. His brogues could do with the polish too. He'd do it later. For now, he pulled on a pair of Levi 501s with a quarter-inch turn-up sewn into the hems. He tucked in a green window paint Arnold Palmer shirt. He was well pleased with that particular shirt. Green socks, 
laced up antique cherry red ducks with yellow laces and a black tank top over the shirt once he pulled his braces over his shoulders. Looking at the wardrobe mirror, he ran his hand over his head to smooth over his number four crop before cramming money into his right front pocket and his keys into the left. He blew a kiss to the picture of Madeline and he was off out the door. This Saturday, he planned to meet Dennis at noon. They were going to check out Count Shelley's third world record shop down in Stoke Newington and Rhodes. And when they get there, they'll get some of these. This is third world records, Stoke Newington Road. Staying local meant there was little chance of bumping into any of Kessler's mates. That's the rival gang. There was a Cornell Campbell tune he wanted to give a listen. And from there, they'd likely head up west to Daddy Cool, another reggae shop. But this one was on Hamway Street in Soho. It was run by a notoriously bad-tempered West Ham fan called Keith, who seemed to delight in arguing with anyone over anything. Buying records there, and they had a top draw selection, and getting insulted by Keith was as much a reggae fan's right as passage as their first kiss and their first beer. They'd had a good afternoon. He'd picked up Dillinger's I First, a spaced out workout, a spaced out workout on the My Conversation rhythm. Cornell Campbell's mashy down on a sweet Lord Cuss 12 inch, as well as Junior Mervyn in top form on Cool Out Sun over Real Rock, and produced by his faves, The Mighty Two, on the Buxom Heavy Duty label. He'd also grabbed a couple of singles for Ingrid, who's his girlfriend in this book. The Clash's Cost of Living EP, which was a belter, and the Flaming Groovies doing Werewolves of London. Dennis had some joy too, with a great DJ tune, Barnabas Collins by Lone Ranger, plus Captain Simbad's Pressure Rock and LKJ's Want to Go Rave. Now, I thought I'd have a single here, but I don't. Anyway, you can edit that bit out and all looks smart. Nice. It was a Saturday night, so they chatted about what bands were playing that evening. Prince Farai was in town. He'd been putting out some killers on his Cry Tough label. The only ones were gigging, but Joe reckoned there'd be too many raincoats. Essential logic, but Dennis said too many students. They both liked the idea of going to see Black Slate. They'd been seeing them live since the Rock Against Racism gigs in 1977. The chords were possible, but they'd inevitably be rucks. And at that, so they set the... Yeah. The chords are possible, but they'd inevitably be rucks at that. So they settled on the members. The band had one of the better hits of 1979. As a result of that and a solid gigging reputation, the gig was packed. Joe and Dennis were both there after dropping their records at home, having their tea and getting changed. Dennis had his at home. Joe went to the calf. The food was hot and cheap. Old men sat pushing their food around their plates. Arsenal had once that had something to celebrate. They'd sing over a few beers this evening. But whether the team won, lost or drew, they were going nowhere. Joe was happy that music and style got him beyond the nine to five. He liked to dress smart. It reminded the Toffs that even though he was a worker, he was as good as, better than they. Dennis was in a beige cord Levi jacket and trousers, a white Fred Perry and baseball boots. Joe had polished his brogues, they gleamed and the Blakeney's knelt to the heels and toes made sure he stepped loudly. He was in a pair of gold and green tonic trousers and a navy blue large gingham Brutus button down, as happens much like this one. He wanted to look good as Ingrid was also along with them. She'd made an effort too and was rocking a pill logo t-shirt with a leather jacket over that. She had a short monochrome dog tooth skirt that accentuated the black of her jacket. Along with them were Paul Barrett, Adina, Matt, Chuck, Little Ian, Chris Lowe, Crop Deads, Arrogans, Levi Jackets, Boots and Braces. As the band came on, the crew moved from the bar towards the stage. The member singer Nicky Tesco was resplendent in a leopard skin jacket and the band quickly worked up the sweat, as did the crowd. The band played a magnificent mix of punk and reggae. It was something of a standard for punk bands to drop some reggae, and not all did it well. The members felt reggae rather than fashioned it. Their punk numbers had an authentic kick to them. Their songs were evocative thumbnail sketches. They spared neither pathos nor humour. There was pogoing, there was skanking, and the whole place was enjoying the night. And as it happens... That's the members' album there. Already outside the gig, police were pushing people around. 
Young punk rockers mostly. Stopping, searching, tripping them over, insulting and provoking. There'd been a couple of arrests. Now the crowd was pining out of the venue. Now the crowd was pining out of the venue. The police were lined up on either side of the doors and yanking out anyone they didn't like the look of. Joe and his mob kept well together. They'd learned from football how to react to the police. There was no love for them in East London, or the rest of London for that matter. Joe's Bundist granddad still toasted by lifting his sliver of it and saying, Daloy, policy. Dan with the police. Perfect. Done. Brilliant. So you've, you're working on another book, aren't you? Yes, I've actually pretty much written most of it. Um, and uh, we're getting crowdfunded at the moment with Unbound. Great. And we'll put the links at the bottom of where you can get, how you can um, contribute to that, but also where you can get Moonstomp from um, as well. Um, the links will be below this video. Um, so I suppose you could read a couple of poems now, if I you don't do. mind. <laughs> Um, let's have a look. This one kind of following on, actually this book here is called No Weakness. And I ripped it pretty much the same time as I was writing uh, that previous book, Moonstomp. And it's very much um, snapshot poems of girls I was seeing late 70s, early 80s. So it's mostly around the sort of Skinner girlfriends I had at the time when I was a teenager. Did you only go out with skinheads just out of curiosity? I would go out with anyone who would have me. <laughs> Which, uh, to be honest, wasn't a long list, but there we go. I've aged well. <laughs> this one is called All the Skinhead Girls I Ever Went Out With. Were tougher than me. Had to be. Most could shut a pump to silence. All could talk to the Monopoly boot came home. The blue of Levi jackets and jeans echoed India ink tattoos. Their eyes the same green as the liquor grace in their double double. On Saturday night, I heard Alibaba and I wanted my dream last night, last night. A monkey boot scraping my shin. The stick of cinema carpet as the adverts finish and the action begins. Great. Thank you. Uh, actually, as we're talking libraries, young people uh, may not know pulp literature was quite the thing when... Uh, you and me were younger, and so we were reading all these kind of books yep. that were about all the sort of teenage sex and violence that teenagers yep. never get up to. <laughs> they were very easy reads as well, weren't they, for teenagers? You could just go yeah, through them, I mean, yeah. I've got loads of them still, and it's, it's surprising how bad they are, but at the same time, so entertaining. Yeah, yeah, I had a couple that were you know, set in female prisons and oh, all sorts, all sorts going on. You never wanted on. to go there, did you, since then? No, no, no. Exactly. Since then, I thought, oh, Prisoner Self-Lock H was so tame compared to that book. <laughs> There's only so much Danny Mute to wear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's your what's your um like, next and final, I guess, poem going to be? Yeah, well, this is a poem. Here it is called Looking My Love which uh, is named after Baron Alevi. So actually, uh, to be honest, the most exciting thing about this poem since then is I did uh, a night and I had a interpreter who did it as sign language, uh, who I couldn't see because she was stood behind me, but apparently she caught me very well. Are you doing fanciful sign language? Which uh, I was quite pleased about, even though I never got to see it. This is called Looking My Love. My first whistle, wolf that is, was from her as I was bowling up Clapton Common, rude and ruddy on a sunny spring morning and i was fabulous i love that poem thank you that's one of my favorites and i'm going to leave the watchers listeners whatever viewers to look up what nevish means in their own time that's what libraries give it are for. away huh that's what libraries are for exactly that's what libraries are for come into the library when we reopen and look it up <laughs> Tim Wells, thank you. Thank you very much um, for sharing your um, poems and your uh, fantastic book with us. And um, we hope to see you very soon. Take That'd care. Be lovely.